All right, so I'm going to do like former Michigan running back. Um, back in Chicago, I'll just freestyle it. Uh, we can do it after later. Cool. Locally known, generally unknown, you know. Local superstar. No, Lo- no, 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 that's no, how no, I got no. it. Local, Arguably the greatest local? Illinois high school football player. I saw you on that Twitter thread the other day. I, man, <laughs> they pissed me the fuck off. Right, Talking about that. John Durgo? He was nice, but he ain't fucking with yeah, me. Yeah, no. Nah. I mean, and I wanted to tell him, I was like, y'all saying that because he's white, low key. Because he was. He was. We're, sounds better like this. Or we're just going. Like we'll probably just yeah. go. Yeah. Without the like without this, the intro. All right, but yeah, you do the intro. As long as as long as you were cool, is is that okay to post? So we're here at the Lyrical Lemonade office in Chicago. Uh, we welcome former Michigan running back Ty Isaac, um, Illinois legend, high school legend. <laughs> Facts. Uh, you know, my boy Elliot was like, yo, if you're in town, we got to get someone, you know, from the city. Mm-hmm. And so he he reached out to me. He was like, yo, you know, Ty Isaac. I was like, sounds familiar. Play, uh, played at Michigan. I went to Notre Dame. So, um, you know, cross paths a little bit. But uh, happy to have you here. Appreciate Isaac and appreciate, you know, uh, Lyrical for al- allowing this space. But thanks for coming. All right. Yes, sir. And so obviously you guys were just, you know, rapping about uh, some some – high school you know chatter on twitter yeah so this interview basically stemmed from i was on twitter last week and i saw this thread and they were talking about like the greatest illinois high school player ever or maybe performance ever so the thing was it was the best best high school player you've personally seen right so as i'm responding it could be you know for me it would have been somebody i seen when i was a kid Mm -hmm. so so i saw this thread and uh this dude from cold city named nick shipkowski uh he was like, he's like a personality around here. He was on 670 to score forever. Yeah, yeah. But he was tweeting. They were talking about this dude from Morris back in the day, John Durgo, who was a dog. Mm-hmm. And then I randomly saw Ty get tagged in this tweet. <laughs> I started seeing all this chatter. So, like, Ty popped back up in my head. And I've been sending him merch for years. Like, we've known each other via the internet. Yeah. And then, Sean, you just so happened to be here. So, I was like, yo, do you know Ty? Like, this would work out perfect. Right, now, here real. we are. No, definitely. And I also reached out to my uh, home, Nick Wisher. Yeah, he know. went to, uh, what, Hinsdale? No, 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 he went to Maris. He played at Maris when okay. I was, yeah, I remember mm-hmm. Nick. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I'm having Ty on. He was like, yo, he's a legend. So <laughs> clearly uh, a lot of people, you know, know you around here. But, no, I'm, you know, thankful for having you on. But this could be a thing to where, obviously, I feel like a lot of people enjoy, you mm-hmm. know, that that battle on Twitter to where it's just, or just social media in general yeah. to where it's like who's the best player you've seen. And so maybe we'll – me and Elliot will take a tour to find out who's the. Uh, we'll do a little a bracket or something like that, and yeah, we find out who's the baddest the ba- dude from your state. Who's yeah, the baddest yeah, dude yeah, from yeah. your state? So, uh, but obviously, you know, former Michigan running back. So, mm-hmm. you know, back you said you're back in town, living yep. in Chicago. So, what are you up to now? Uh, right now, I was working for a buddy of mine. I'm actually trying to get into the uh, like medical device sales field. Mm-hmm. It seems like everybody I played with is doing that now. So I'm like, let me jump on board. You guys look like you're making some money. I mm-hmm. want some. Now, have you ever, like, always wanted to be in sales? Because, well, outside, like, obviously, you know, the, the goal was the NFL and to play the game. But, uh, any, you know, was there a passion in sales or anything that came real, up? Man, I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm sure you were probably the same way. I grew up thinking I was just, man, NFL or bust. That's all I want to do. That's all my focus is on. So, I know for me personally, when things didn't work out, I was like, shit, what am I going to do? Honestly, mm-hmm. it took me probably about a year, year and a half to kind of – get my feet and figure out what I want to do. Cause for a, a lot of it, it was, you know, well, what do you, what do you like besides football? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Cause mm-hmm. that, that was my life for a long time. But, uh, you know, I got to the point where it was like, all right, you know, it's time to be good at something else. And that kind of pushed me in that direction. Mm-hmm. No. Actually for both of you guys, I'm curious, like, and obviously we'll go back. We'll talk about JCA, USB, right. all that type of shit. But for both of y'all, what was it like when you finished playing sports mm-hmm. and you were forever known as like athlete? What, what was that kind of, I'd imagine there's some sort of identity, like, not a crisis, but, you know, like, what was that like for you guys? For for me, it's just it's just kind of, it's different because before when you go on, like, Instagram, or I'll, I'll just use, like, social media for now, but it was like, if you look at my feed probably a year ago, it's just all football, mm-hmm. all sports, whatever, whatever, and it's like, Likes are crazy, you know. The engagement's crazy, right. like, hey, yeah, like it's, a, so, it's yeah. like a, it's like a good feeling or whatever. And then, uh, cause you know, people like people probably fo- like probably seventy five percent of people who follow you is, is because because you're an athlete. And right. so, um, just now, you know, transitioning from that is like, 
even in conversation, it's like, oh, I'm a, a former Notre Dame football player right. and things like that. It, it's different, you know, because before it was like, okay, I, I, I play for Notre Dame or I, I play in the NFL. And so, uh, you know, it, it took some time to adjust to, but at the end of the day, it's just like trying to just, you know, make a path or, you know, make a way into a new field. And so I think like once it's tough, don't get me wrong, but I feel like once you can do that, then I feel like you'll just recreate, you know, a whole new following, a whole yeah. new identity, I guess. Yeah, nah, you ain't lying. Every time I post anything not football related, I lose like 50 followers. I'm <laughs> like, damn, y'all don't fuck with me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, nah, I, I think that plays a factor in it. And then I think, too, I know for me, I would kind of just look at people where it's like, you know, even, you know, for you, your calling may be interviewing people and doing podcasts, right? Yours could be in the music field, but you have your purpose. I was kind of walking around like, man, what what else am I going to be good at? You know what I'm saying? I think I'm sure you can vouch for this. Like, it's addicting being that good at something, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. To be, you know, top two, three, four, five percent in the world at what you do is an addicting feeling because... There's a lot that goes into mm -hmm. it. You didn't just show up at Notre Dame and you were a baller. Like, it took a lot of time and work and effort. And uh, I think that's kind of what I missed the most because it was like, you know, I got 20-plus years into this, and that was what I was best at. So what am I going to do now? What else can I go be good at? So I think, you know, and obviously not everybody goes through that, but I know for me personally, I was like, shit, you know, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. And so what, what was something that you even, like, in, during that process that helped you you know, not even not. I wouldn't say like just find your purpose, but like mm -hmm. what what were some things that helped you just get out of bed in the morning? Because like for me, mm -hmm. it was like in school, you you know, but it was like you always had somewhere to go. You had yeah. a schedule. Yeah. It was you had structure. Um, but like now, it was like even you know when you playing, it's like you got structure. You got you got treatment. You got film. You got mm -hmm. practice. You got meals. Right. You got film after that, and then it's bedtime. And then you started all over. But then like when you're not on the team, it's like. Bro, like I, I got a whole twenty four hours. Like you now, you gotta yeah, you is. gotta figure out like what I'm gonna do in these twenty four hours. So yep. kind of just you know talk about like what got you out of you know bed to mm -hmm. to get going. Um, so I've always been into like racing bikes, cars, whatever it may be. Just you know from growing up, my pops was into it. Um, man, once I once I bought a I bought a bike my senior year at Michigan. I just bought it and just put it up because I knew I couldn't do nothing with it. But uh. As soon as I got done playing, honestly, I just everything was kind of all my time and effort was put into that just because I was like, you know, it's something to do. I enjoy it. And like you say, I'm not just sitting around being lazy. And then at that point, it was like, all right, cool. Now I want to go out of town and race or I want to do this. And so now I need to make sure. Cool. Like me and my buddy, especially during COVID, we started a little business. You know, we're working every day and that kind of. I would say, in short, like racing and the, and the motorcycles and stuff like that is kind of what got me back going because it did. It got me in a routine to where I'm doing things where it is structured because I know I was always a type, like, when we were in school, I'm like, damn, bro, like, I can't do nothing until 8. Like, you mm -hmm. wake up at 6 and your day is regimented until 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I lost that, I was like, I need that structure. Like, that's what helps me get going. Like, I feel way more efficient when you got – yeah, I could do it in an hour or two. Like, I kind of like that pressure of, hey, you got to be here at this time mm -hmm. and do it. So I know for me, I've had to recreate that for myself because I'm not good with just an open, like you say, open 24. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to jump back to the start, right? Mm -hmm. So I was telling Sean yesterday, like, JCA mm -hmm. in, like, Illinois football is, like, as good as it gets. It's yeah. one of the most prestigious programs ever. How was your experience at JCA? Um. It was all right. I mean, I, I, for me, I guess it was normal. I was, you know, when I, growing up, my dad went there. He won state there. So I knew as a kid, I knew I was going there. Like, I didn't know what middle school I was going to, but I knew what high school mm -hmm. I was going to. So, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, we did good in football, went to state a couple of times. Uh, you know, I was able to play at the next level. I mean, to be honest, that's all I was really looking for. Um, you know, had some good friends. There's people that I'll be lifelong friends with, talk to to this day. But, um, you know, it served its purpose for me. We had a good football program. I was able to benefit to it, from it, um, you know, go to a good school, get a degree. So, you know, I, I have no complaints. Do you have a favorite moment from your playing time at JCA? <sighs> favorite moment? Mm, 
I know most people would say the state game, but we lost, so that shit wasn't no I, fun. I was telling Sean about it yesterday. Do, what was your? Do you remember your stat line in the state I ran, game? I had 515 yards and six touchdowns, and we lost by 25. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, we didn't finish the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 we lost by 25. You guys lost that game by 25? By 25. I did not remember that. What, what was the final score? Because 70 to 45. Yeah, I was about to say, like, at some point, so. And this is how you know it was a long time ago. I got on the bus on the way home. I had, like, 1,100 friend requests on Facebook. I thought I was raw. I thought I was popping. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, I did. I thought I was wrong. The whole ride back from uh, Champagne, I'm scrolling. Yeah, no, we even looked it up yesterday. Like your average ca- uh, per yards mm-hmm. was uh, or per carry was uh, 20, 20 that yards game? per carry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that honestly that was wild. I think that was the only time. That was the only two times in high school I went over twenty carries in a game, and that was one of them. That's crazy. That's, yeah, that's actually wild. You went to state how many times at JCA? I went twice. My freshman year, we lost by one to Montini, and then junior, we fucking got thumped. That's so. crazy. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's an interesting story because I like we were we were watching a game and mm-hmm. it got to a point to where it's like okay, like you touch the ball, you're scoring, mm-hmm. and your defense couldn't really stop anyone either. But I it was, was like, all right, bet like sure. they, like at some point, like he scored. If you if I see the stat if I see the stat line and you run a rush over five hundred yards and six touchdowns, I'm assuming that you won the game. Yeah, no, you think you game, <laughs> <laughs> bro. That's nah. like that's like a season for some kids in high school. That's crazy. Um, what was I gonna say? Damn. So you you never won state. Mm-mm. Damn, I never nope. pieced that together. I think mm-hmm. I never fully watched that game. I just Mm-mm. you see the stat line, you kind of assume. No, but, yeah, um, I, that, yeah. I would say that was probably I'd be my biggest knock. On high school, because mm-hmm. I mean, but anybody, everybody wants to win state. You yeah, know, what do you play for? So. Yeah, facts. And, and and you look you look at that to where it's like, you know, you look at the personal uh, mm-hmm. or the individual accolades that you've had. Right. Um, it was like ESPN Player of the Year, and mm-hmm. then all all the state awards that you won as right. well. So you know, obviously, you know, individually, you did your thing, and mm-hmm. uh, you you go on to you know USC, which I was telling him yesterday, like a kid from the Midwest, USC is like a dream, you know, like especially. Yeah. And then like at that time, it was like we watched Reggie Bush growing up, we watched Lindell <laughs> White. So you already know the deal. We watched we watched all them growing up. Right. So it's like for me, it was like okay, yeah, I love USC, and then mm-hmm. it was Texas too with yep. Vince Young and things like that, but. I was a four star and I didn't even get like I didn't even get a call from USC. So for for me to see a you know a Midwest kid go out to USC and have that offer, what what was you know that experience like and also what made you, you know, want to go there? Um I'm, that was the spring of my junior year. Um I remember I was sitting in the head coach office and he was like, All right, you know, you got X amount of offers, you know, most of them are pretty good. Is there anything you're waiting on? And I remember telling him, I said, yeah, I want to see if SC offers me. I want to see what Bama does and maybe one other school. Just kind of wait and see. And, uh, man, that following week, a coach from Alabama May came in on Monday or Tuesday. We, you know, talked a little bit. He said, hey, you know, we like you. Um, be interested in offering you, but you got to come down, see coach and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh, all right, you know, cool. And I knew I wasn't going to go there just because it's Bama, and I, I get it. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, but I did. I wanted to offer. Everybody wants that. Just, you right. know what I'm saying? Throw yeah, no, rivals. definitely. But, uh, like, two days later, they sent a dude in from SC. He offered me, and uh, I kind of knew right then. Because, like you said, I grew up. I, the the only game I've ever cried when somebody lost is when SC lost to Texas in 05. <laughs> I was mm-hmm. sick to my stomach. But, uh yeah, no, when he came in and did that, I went on my visit, and I was – it was pretty close, man. I ain't going to lie. Like, seeing Coach – like, Chuck Martin and mm-hmm. Tony Alford, I would see them once or twice a week. So, it was. It was tight coming down from SC and, like, Michigan and Notre Dame. But I think, you know, going out there, I'm the type I, – I got bad FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. And I was like, man – I only got one opportunity to do this. They're only going to want me one time. I'd much rather go out there, and if it don't work, I can say I did it, and it didn't work, as opposed to I don't want to go somewhere and wonder. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't have no regrets about that. I mean, what are the odds of having three head coaches in less than a calendar year? You know, it's it's not very common. You know, I played for five head coaches in college, so I know that's not the best hand dealt, but I know 
like if Orgeron would have stayed, I'd have never left SC mm -hmm. personally. Um, I know when Sarkeesian got there, he was like, uh, what do you say? He said he was tired of losing LA kids to like Oregon and Washington right. and this and that. So he was like, we're going to start the pipeline back up. And I'm sitting there as a homely dude from the Midwest on the mm -hmm. team. I'm like, well, at least he let me know now nah, I can go ahead and get up out the way. So mm -hmm. it was fun though, man. I, I mean, I'm, like you said, how many? I didn't know too many people going to SC. So mm -hmm. once I got the offer, it was everything that I'd known about it, what I ended up liking about it. And then it's no different than Notre Dame. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You get that offer. It's like, man, this is the place. Did you have any culture shock going from like a kid growing up in the Midwest to now living in Southern California? Oh, yeah. I'll never forget the first time we had orientation. I ended up meeting one of my best friends out there. He took us to his to his crib, right? He was like, you know, if you guys want to hang out, I know you're off all weekend, come up. Takes us to Calabasas, right? And it wasn't, and I didn't know nothing about the place at the time, but I knew something was up when we go through, you know, a little security gate, right? Then we drive through the neighborhood, going up the hill, going up the hill. Then there's a second security gate. <laughs> so I'm like, y'all got a gate inside a gate. We go in and all these houses look like, it, I, I don't even know, how to, like, just huge. Mm -hmm. I know my buddy, his next-door neighbor at the time was Bieber, right? So I had to tell him, I'm like, man, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a solid household, you know, good family, middle class, but, like, this isn't real life to me. Like, mm -hmm. this is unfathomable. Like, y'all got 10 bedrooms and a pool and a pool house and 10 cars. I'm like, this is just different. And you know how it is going to these big schools. Like, mm -hmm. Notre Dame kids, they come for money. Right. Like, I, don't, I don't know what your background is, but for mm -hmm. me, I was looking at them. I'm like, wow, dude. Like, to have that type of stuff accessible to me, like, I feel like this is my only way to do it, and this is just normal to you. Mm -hmm. So I would say that was the biggest shock to me is seeing, like, there's so many different ways to get to where these people are as opposed to where I looked at it where, like, I could only do this if I ball out. Like, I could only achieve this if I play. So – it kind of gave me a little perspective shift. Like, there, there's plenty of ways to get to it, and they are. They're, you know, smart, intuitive people who are good at what they do, and I would say, yeah, it was a culture shock seeing that type of money and that type of, you know, accessibility to things, but it kind of did help me because it kind of lit a fire under me. I'm like, man, I got to, you know, I got to yeah. network. I got to connect with these people. I got to figure out what they're doing to do this and how can I get on this level. I definitely want to touch on that point, too, just because you you can look at, you know, uh, just our culture, you know, mm -hmm. any, you know, black kid growing up, we may see we may think that the only way is through yeah. athletics, entertainment, um, you know, streets, anything like that. That's the only way to to reach those heights. Right. But, you know, first you get out there to to USC and to go to Calabasas, you know, within your first week there and see that and. You know, you, you talk about the, the switch flipping, but for you, you, you you bring it back to, you know, the way for you to get there is athletics. Right. And, you know, obviously, like, we're having this conversation now and, you know, not in the NFL mm. and things like that. But you ever still think about, think back to that moment and be like, athletics is not the only way? Because now, now you sit from a point to where it's like, back then it was like, okay, the only way I'm going to get it is, you know, going to the NFL. But mm. it's like now, you know, Fast forward, it's like I'm not in the NFL, but that's still the dream. Right. What What are some ways that, like, thinking back to that moment, like, that you now see yourself to where it's like, because I think a lot of, like, younger kids mm -hmm. listening mm -hmm. could learn from this, you know, yep. this point right here. So what, what are some ways you think that, uh, I guess, some other ways, you know, to get it? To be 100% honest with you, I think it was the process of, like, going through school networking with these regular students, meeting people that are like when you have the football where they bring alumni in mm -hmm. and you know what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. have these mixers and they tell you about all these things. And I guess now looking at it, there's a million ways that you can make money. Right. And I think that a lot of times, you know, especially coming from that athletic background where you feel like that's the only way, you, you have blinders on. Mm. And that's kind of how I was. I, I could not fathom how there was any way I could make any sizable money if it was not playing football. Right? And fast mm. forward to now, I know that's not true. Um, 
I just think the biggest thing is having to keep your horizons open. There's definitely things that I may have not wanted to do or wasn't interested in just because I felt like I needed to do sports and sports only. But, man, if, if you're in a situation, it really doesn't matter where you're at. If you can network with people who are good at what they're doing mm-hmm. and, and, you know, figure out whatever it is, whatever you're good at. You know, you could be really good at preparation. You could be really good at, you know, doing your whatever it may be that you're good at. I'm going to try and take that trait from you or however Sean does this. I want to try and emulate that to further myself. And I I would say just, you know, being around some of the people that I was with at school, kind of like I said, it it opened my eyes Mm because, you know, I got buddies right now never played a single down of football ever ever and they're millionaires just from working and being in the right situation and doing what they're supposed to do and stuff like that is going to be motivating to anybody because mm. it's like that that's available to me mm. i have the same opportunity to go out and do that even if i have to work a little bit harder because of circumstance that's okay i still have the opportunity to so mm. I, I think that was the biggest thing for me is realizing that there is opportunity for me it's not i'm not just categorized or placed in in a category by anyone else If you do that, I feel like you're doing it to yourself to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't have my horizons as broad as it should have been, so I categorized myself when I could have branched out. I wish I would have done that sooner. Mm. No, that's definitely, I mean, that's huge, because even I look at that to where it's like, I went to Notre Dame, Mm -hmm. and it probably took me to my senior year to really start, like, networking and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, taking advantage of just the people on campus, the opportunities, the resources, all those things, because... Like you mentioned, blinders on. Mm-hmm. You like I chose Notre Dame, but obviously, you, when you when you're a high school kid, it's like okay. I looked at it; it was like they on TV every weekend. Um, it's not too far from home. I'm from Ohio, so it's right. not too far from home. Education, you you know, you always want to throw the education piece in there, but like when you get there, it's like, yo, I'm here to go to the league. Yeah, straight and up. And so even when I got there, I got hurt like my first year, and then I was like, I'm still here to go to the league. Yeah. I got hurt my second year, and I was like. I'm still here to go to the league. Mm -hmm. And then third year, I played it. I played, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to the league. And then senior year, ended up getting hurt again. I was like, shit, I got to find, like, I got to take advantage of the resources here because, you know, now the window for the, you know, the NFL and those things are just, you know, smaller and smaller. So to hear you say that is obviously huge. And so you playing at USC. Mm -hmm. Um, You played as a freshman, too. You, you You got some work in as a freshman. So, Obviously, that's dope. You play. You play. Was you your first year? Were you home at Notre Dame, or did you did Notre so, Dame come there? We went to Notre Dame. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So talk talk about that experience because I'm sure that was a good one for your family to come out, friends to come out, and then also for you to just you know play against a school yeah. that was recruiting you. So we came, we came out we came out on a Thursday morning because mm-hmm. you guys were on Eastern time mm-hmm. and we was we was on Pacific time, whatever. So we came out two days earlier. Stayed in the worst hotel I've ever stayed in in a college <laughs> setting. It was terrible. But uh, it was fun, man, because I was. I was so homesick. My freshman year, oh, mm. my God, bro. When you talk about sick as a dog, I, 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 it, was, it was so bad that in November when it was 80 degrees out, I was like, man, I miss the cold. I miss seasons. Mm. That's how homesick mm-hmm. I was. But uh, it was a good experience, man. I um, did I probably use 20 tickets on the game. I had, you know, my whole family come out. Um, you know, my people come visit me Thursday night, Friday night in the hotel, just when we had free time. So mm-hmm. it was cool to see them. And, uh, actually Orgeron let me after the game on Saturday night, cause I live about an hour and a half away. He let me go home and fly from O'Hare Sunday night back to school. So wow. I went home, kicked it. I spent the Sunday with my people and then like eight, nine o'clock I flew back home. And I was sick. I woke up. I uh, My boy picked me up from the airport. I went back to the dorm. And I woke up in the morning. I was like, where am I at? This is not my room. And I realized I was in L.A. I'm like, oh, damn, homesick again. But uh, yeah. it was, man. It was a good time. I was actually talking to my uncle not too long ago. I was giving him a hard time. I was like, you never came to a game. He was like, what you mean? He was like, I was at Notre Dame your freshman year, blah, blah, blah. And he remembered the only time they gave me a carry, we were on our – we were on our eight yard line. Mm-hmm. We had a two yard run. I was like, damn, freshman year on the eight yard. This is when you want to give me a yeah. carry. But it was, man. It was fun. And then uh man, that's I feel like so I played UCLA, played against Notre Dame. I didn't get a chance to play against Michigan or Notre Dame when I was at Michigan, mm-hmm. but obviously played against Ohio State. You know, those are four four of the biggest rivalries in college football ever. So mm-hmm. it was fun to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. 
No, definitely talk about because even this game this past year, mm -hmm. um, we could definitely talk about that too. To where you see USC versus UCLA, mm -hmm. the quarterbacks in that game they were going crazy. crazy. You know, uh, DTR and then Caleb Williams who mm -hmm. ended up winning a Heisman. But talk about that rivalry, and then well, this will be a good transition into you know the Michigan and uh, Michigan career and the Michigan uh, Ohio State rivalry. Dude, football is different out there. Not in a bad way. I, you know, Cal, Cali's got ballers, so it's mm -hmm. not that. It's just, uh, I just like where I'm from, Joliet, on a Friday. Oh man, that whole stadium, the whole parking lot is shut down. That's mm -hmm. what we doing tonight. When you live in LA, the stadium was kind of empty when we play UCLA or Stanford because it's like there's a million things to do in LA. The weather's always perfect. Like. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't the same. You know what I'm saying? Coming from the Midwest where people eat, sleep, and breathe, you know, that's it. Football. Mm -hmm. That's all they do. Um, I just felt like it was a little bit different. I didn't feel like it was lesser. It was just I couldn't quite put my thumb on it. You know what I'm saying? I tell people all the time, it just different vibe. That's the best I could say. Um, but going from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten, night and day. Cause I mean, we could we could go play an away game at Oregon State, and you might play in front of I don't know forty forty five thousand people, right? Mm -hmm. That ain't gonna happen. You go to Penn State, that's one hundred and five right. guaranteed. You go to O State, that's packed. Anywhere we traveled, basically, it was gonna be packed no matter what. Um, it and well, you know how it is. Well, I actually you wouldn't. When I was at SC and we played Notre Dame. I was like, oh, my God, them the biggest dudes I've ever seen in my life. Because it was. It looked like they was two, three times bigger than everybody we played yeah. in the Pac-12. So I know when I made the switch and came to the Big Ten, I'm like, God. That's we, interesting. That's huge. interesting because every time we play, like, we play some good U.S. Like, we play Juice Team, yep. Midori, uh, Ronald Jones, mm -hmm. Sam Darnold, like, some really good USC teams. But it was like whenever we played them, it was like, all right, like, after a while, it's going to get cold. You know, the sun will go down. Mm -hmm. They they already like we we kind of saw USC as as soft. Yeah, no, I and, mean I'm from the Midwest, so mm -hmm. hell yeah, you play when it's 80 degrees all the time. Come come see me in November mm -hmm. and football weather, and we'll see. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you on that, and that's kind of how I feel on the sideline. Like man, like I would think to myself, like I hope I hope we straight because we did. We played at Notre Dame, cold as hell, and then we played at Colorado November night game. Coldest game I ever played in my mm -hmm. life, and it's that's real deal in Colorado. Mm -hmm. You cannot breathe, so I'm up there. I can't breathe, and I'm freezing. <laughs> I burnt the bottom of my cleats off on the jet dryer. I oh, couldn't feel yeah, my feet, so yeah. I'm sitting there putting my feet up there, like, "Hey, hey, you smell that?" I'm like, mm -hmm. "Oh, dude, I, I can't move." They look, look at your cleat. My shit was melted. It yeah. looked like this on the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be interesting too, because like, uh, I think in two years, or, I thought it was this upcoming year. UCLA and SC are coming. That too, but like the playoffs are expanding to, to twelve teams. They're going to twelve. Yeah, I thought so it was gonna be eight. the playoffs going to expand to twelve teams, and then the like the the top seeds get a, so I think top four get a buy. I, I think. was going to say because you and want then, a lot of teams playing like what, almost sixteen, seventeen. Yeah, games. so I think like five through eight they get a home game. Okay, so you talk about that to where it's like it's December. You know, after after your your champ your bowl or your uh, conference oh, we, championship we love game, we to host TCU in a, in an outside a playoff game. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, I would, yeah, yeah. Or or a SC or them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nah, because that does that makes a difference. Like, if you ain't never played in cold, you know how it is, dude. Mm -hmm. I feel like I lose a step until like it takes a minute. Oh to nah, get yeah, you up. definitely slower. Like when you get out there, hey. you know. You know you're not gonna be as fast as you would on a on an August man, or a September them hits day. Be stinging, bro, man, man it ain't mm -hmm. no giving the pads. Everything that got brittle, yeah, no, nah, them winter games suck, especially if you're not used to it. Um, can we talk about the decision process, right? When you were transferring from SC, mm -hmm. what made you want to go to Michigan? It was actually a crazy story. So, when I was transferring out, did all my paperwork and everything, and when you're transferring. Wait, why transfer first? Why'd you transfer? So, when all when the whole process started, I never. It was just kind of hard for me, right? You got these coaches and these universities who have millions of dollars available to them to make my visit and my experience seem like the best thing ever. And yeah, I, man, I'm easily impressionable. Every time I went on a visit, I'm like, damn, this place is raw. I could go to school here. So I kind of feel like not rushed, but I want to make my decision to go to SC real early. 
But I told somebody, I said, hey, something's telling me they're going to fire my running back coach and they're going to get rid of Kiffin before the season is over. That's just my gut feeling. If that happens, I don't want to be there, right? That's just – and I and I said this probably in late November. You know when you sign, February? Mm-hmm. So February hit, did signing day. The following day they fired the running back coach. Can't do anything now. You sign a national letter of intent. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, what are you going to do? Um, went through like three or four games. We went and got our ass kicked at Arizona State, and then they fired Kiff. And I was like, man, that was kind of like my last, you know, God, the last yeah. lifeline. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah, you got the rest of the staff there, and they were all very good to me, but these are the dudes that recruited me. Right. You know, so, um, like I said, Orgeron was there. They gave him the head coaching job. I would have stayed. Like, he was, you know how it is. I, I'm not sure how Coach Kelly was, but Orgeron was the type of dude where he see you in the hallway. Hey, Sean, come in. Just talk mm-hmm. to me. I want to know how you're doing. Is everything going good? You know, I told your parents I'd take care of you. Like, he was that type of coach, so I'd have played for him. Um, when Sarkeesian came in, you know, no real issues. Uh, just just wasn't a real mesh or fit there. You know, we went to spread no huddle. Wasn't really just, – it just wasn't clicking. So, at that point, I went in and got all my stuff together to transfer and – as soon as I hand, if you're the head coach, I hand you a piece of paper. This is, you know, I'm asking for my release, blah, blah, blah. You get seven days. In that seven days, that's when they can come back and say, all right, you can't transfer to Notre Dame or Stanford, wherever. You know what I'm saying? They can put all their blocks in. So I went and did that, and I didn't hear nothing. And at that point, I was. I was talking to Chuck Martin a lot, and I was talking to, was talking to Notre Dame, Michigan, and University of Illinois. Talking to them a lot, talking to them a lot. The seventh day comes up, and uh, SC never sent us anything. And mind you, I, I put in my request right after spring ball, so you know a lot of coaches take off, they're mm-hmm. on vacation, doing whatever they're doing. So, you know, doing my thing, I'm waiting, and they never say anything. And in the back of my head, I'm like, man, I, I hope they forgot, because if they forgot, I was, go I was going to go to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. If they forgot and they didn't say anything and I was clear to go anywhere, I was going to go to Notre Dame. That's that's what I wanted to do. Um, somebody in my camp started freaking out. They're like, we haven't got this release yet, blah, blah, blah. I'm calling. Unbeknownst to me, they called and did their thing, and SC was like, oh, it's seven days. Like, and I mean, we were down to like an hour left. Right. So they sent me back. They blocked, you know, Notre Dame, all the Pac-12 schools, all that. So... I'm I'm very happy I went to Michigan. I'm happy with my decision, but at that given time, if I had not have gotten blocked, that's where I was going. So that was it was kind of a crazy deal, and I was just kind of on the side of you know, mm-hmm. it, it must have been meant to happen that way. And like I said, I, I have no regrets. I have no quarrels about it. But I, a lot of people have no. I mean, I didn't tell anybody that, but mm-hmm. that's how close I was to going there. For that's sure. crazy. It so is. there's an alternate universe where you guys were teammates. And me years ago. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, maybe in the fifth. But also Michigan. crazy, too, though, because I was committed to Michigan before mm-hmm. I flipped to Notre Dame. Yeah. Where well, so, did you commit? I didn't even know that. Uh, I committed. You said when? Yeah. 2013. Well, what class you, what class you come I was 15. Up? So okay. I committed I committed after my sophomore s- season, I believe. And then, so I committed to Brady Hoke. Hey, so you'll know, because I was in the 13 class. Mm-hmm. That whole class was crazy. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. when all them guys were committing, and I was cool with them, mm-hmm. and I was like, man, they're going to be loaded up. Mm-hmm. Like, And that's kind of one of them things, too. I was nervous because I'm like, man, they're getting so many guys, it ain't even going to be an option for me in a mm-hmm. minute. But shit, one of my best friends was committed to Notre Dame for a long time and then flipped to Michigan. People don't really, people don't really be realizing if they don't follow it a lot. Like, People be... This close every mm-hmm. time to being teammates or going to their rival school and this and that. It just, it'd be a lot of crazy stories behind it. What made mm-hmm. you flip? To be honest, it was just that Michigan wasn't mm-hmm. as good as Notre Dame. Oh, man. Every, every, everything was equal for me. Like, I grew up, so I grew up a Michigan fan. So, mm-hmm. like, that's why when I got the offer, I played my sophomore year, year got the offer, and then I committed uh, going into my junior season on my birthday, August 23rd, mm-hmm. committed to Michigan. It was like ESPN, like crazy. Yeah, so like nah, it was like a big rough. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I committed and we played a game like that that weekend. It was it was lit. 
And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to Mi-. like the 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 record didn't bother me because at first, because I was like, yo, I'm going to Michigan. I grew up a Michigan fan. Like Did you this commit in 2014. Yeah. So right yeah, at right. We, hey, yeah. So was, dude, we were terrible. So yeah. We yeah were so so I so I I let that season play out. I didn't have an offer from Notre Dame mm-hmm. at this time. So I played my junior year. Uh, Notre Dame offered me, and I was it was it was the one school that I because you know when you go on visits you go do camps and things like that. Yeah. Uh, if Notre Dame had offered me, I probably wouldn't have committed right. to Michigan just because I re- like my visit to Notre Dame was like. Dang, I I really I really like love this place. Like and that's it's, one it's of those different. Schools too, where yeah, like, you either not gonna like it because I went on visits and I liked it, and the dude I was with was like I hate this, mm-hmm. and and I always knew this is mm-hmm. gonna be one of them places you either gonna love it to death or it's not for you. Yeah, one of the so time. I knew, and I was like, yo, if they offer me, then I'm I'm go I'm I'm good. Yeah, I'm going there. Up. They didn't offer me, so I was like, my parents wanted me to commit before the season just because mm-hmm. they were like, if you get hurt, things like that. So I was like, all right, right. committed to Michigan, played the whole season. Notre Dame offered. So I'm like, oh, it's 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 tough now. So we we went on a visit. I did a I did a weekend. I always talk about this. I did a weekend mm-hmm. trip to uh, Michigan and Notre Dame. So I went to Michigan, went on just like a, a normal visit. Who hung, hosted you? Probably, uh, I think Frank Clark. So because oh, Frank Frank from my hometown. Oh man. Hey, so Frank I, from Cleveland. So Frank told me like every, like he kept it real to it. And I was just gonna say the first day I walked into Michigan was. Uh, like you, so we used to go to a hotel for camp. Mm-hmm. So we checking in, doing our thing. He was the only person came up to me and was like, "Hey, I'm about to give you the real. This is exact." Gave me the whole breakdown of everything. So I had a ten minute for, talk with Nitty, and that was it. Mm-hmm. I, I knew the whole deal. So yeah, you you had a good deal. Yeah, right so there. I was yeah, I was man. good. I was good. I'm like, yo, I, I I'm I'm rocking with it. He's right. like, yeah, I'm coming back for my senior year. Yep. He's like, was, I mean, reasons why he came back. Yep. Um. But so then I went. So the next day I went to Notre Dame. I went to a camp there, mm-hmm. and I was like, "I'm gonna just choose at the at the end of this weekend." And on the right. way home, I was like, "Yo, I'm I'm going to Notre Dame." Who's and your main recruiter at ND? Uh, Kyle McCarthy. He's okay. now a um he's now an athlete's first agent. Okay. So it was it was him, and then uh, I don't even know who the DB. Oh, Coach Cooks. He's okay. now at LSU. But so that's what so that's what happened with my story. Mm-hmm. Ended up you know ended up going there, but. You know, when you transfer back then, I was it wasn't like transferring today. Hell no. So, and I don't even know if they do the process of blocking school. Like, I don't even know if that's a thing. Yeah, I honestly, so I have no idea. That. So, no, it's fine. That concept is crazy that you could block like where a student was going. Well, and it kind of makes sense. I guess back then it made sense anywhere where it's like, you know, if you go going to UCLA, I don't want you to transfer to SC and we got to play against you every, you know. So they did that, but. Honestly, after I got out, like, I have no idea how this portal works. I have no idea. I just know that there's way too many kids in it and not nearly mm-hmm. enough scholarships available. Now, when you transferred, were you able to play that, that nope. first year? Nope, it was too far from home. Mileage, I was, like, I was under 100 miles. I was too far from the house. See, I didn't even know. That's, that's I, interesting. Like, th- so that rule, I didn't been, even know. We were trying to get a medical waiver, right? Okay. We're saying a family member, you know, I'm moving to be closer home, blah, blah, blah. Right, you're trying to get the waiver to play. It was just too far away. So, like, if I'd have done that and been able to go to ND, or if I decided to go to University of Illinois, Mm -hmm. I'd have been within the distance. I'd have been good to go. That's crazy how all these and you know all the things that didn't happen. If they did happen, another crazy thing. I was gonna go with Chuck over in Miami of Ohio. I said, "Fuck it, I'll go with Chuck. He like he like me the most. I know he's gonna take care of me." And somebody from Michigan called, and they was like, "Is like you can do that." And we'll understand why. But if you do that, you're going to prove a lot of them people wrong or prove them right. You know, he wasn't good enough. Now you're going to a small school. And he must have knew I had some ego or something. Mm-hmm. I was like, hell no. Nah. You know what I'm saying? I was yeah. like, all right, bet. If that's what you think, I'll show you. And, I mean, obviously it worked out for everybody. But I was. I mm-hmm. um, Man, once they did the little block and everything, and I was kind of like, man. I just go up to Miami, even if I could ball, go for like twelve, fifteen hundred yards a season, and mm-hmm. see what I could do. You mm-hmm. know, and that was my mindset. I was like, "Fuck it, let's just just go be a dog. It don't matter." Just and that close. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? It just it's a lot that goes in. You know how it is. Them decisions, it's hard too. I'm 18, 19 years old. You tell me it's gonna affect me for forty years. Mm-hmm. I I can't even conceptualize that long. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing next year. Right. So it just. 
like I said, it's crazy how it worked out, but it was so many little things that could have went one way or the other. And right. I'm sure it's like that with plenty of other people. Mm-hmm. But I know at one point I was like, man, I'm going to just go play for Chuck Martin and be done with it. That's crazy. So um, you weren't within that 100-mile radius. I don't know what the exact was. I just know I was a, a little bit over it, like minuscule miles where it was like, come on, bro. Crazy. Right. Um and then, oh yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. So back then, like mm-hmm. when you transferred and you didn't get granted the to, the ability to play right away, do you lose that mm-hmm. year of well, just, eligibility? Because I played my freshman year, so if I'd have redshirted my freshman year mm-hmm. and then went and transferred, I'd have just lost a year of eligibility. But since I played my freshman year, they just used a redshirt. So I like I played a true four years. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now you know I, I'm interested to hear the transition between Hoke. Mm-hmm. To Harbaugh because Hope or Harbaugh got hired like was it Jan- like right after or right after signing day I think or right yeah, before no, it signing was, day it, it had to be because Hope got let go right after our last game mm-hmm. and I, I remember it because everybody was acting a fool because mm-hmm. Hope had a lot a lot of rules like you couldn't bro I know you never heard of this we had a phone box right because apparently they had a problem with it before I got there. It was a box with your number on it, and you had to put your phone in that box for the duration of time you was in, like, this the building. Mm. Like, you walking, like, it was, like, little the stuff, like, time. the yeah. whole time, bro. But I can just remember, as soon as he got let go, everybody was, like, they let their hair down. Everybody was having fun, doing their thing. And then uh, it almost kind of reminded me of how you seen a video with Dion when he came and talked to the Colorado players. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just basically, like, if you want to leave, you can leave. I'm going to bring some guys. We're going to see, you know, what happens. Um, I mean, Harbaugh wasn't much different. He told us straight up, like, this is going to be difficult. Like, the next couple months. He told us, he said, I really only need about 35 guys. No more, no less. You Mm -hmm. know, if I can use you, I'm going to use you. But (laughs) 35, 40, that's the number I need. And uh, he did. (laughs) I'll never forget this. He told us, he said, if you want to have a war of the wills, we can but I'm going to win. And I heard that. I was like, shit, I ain't, I ain't playing that game yeah. with him. He, uh, it was, it was very, it was a militant regime. He told us, he said, I've been watching you guys' games around a three hour mark. You don't start, you, you stop playing as hard. You're not as good. So what we're going to do is we're going to practice for four hours. So spring ball for us was four hours on the field. So Monday, oh you, gosh. Monday, you will come in and lift for 30 minutes. Then you got hour and a half of film install, whatever. Tuesday, you are four hours on the field. It ain't warm up and no, you are seven on seven, eleven on eleven, nine on seven, goal line, team, like for four hours straight. Um we also had like sixty dudes in the hurt group by the end mm-hmm. of by the end of spring ball. But I think if you ask anybody who played for Michigan in that spring of two thousand fifteen, they'll tell you it was man. It was a war of attrition. Dude, you know, dudes are getting hurt. Dudes are transferring, you know, leaving the program. But, I mean, he did what was necessary. We went from, what, four and eight or five and seven or something like that to ten and two. Mm -hmm. Won the Citrus Bowl. So, um, at first, I thought it kind of sucked. But then when I saw the results, it was like, I I don't care. I'm cool. If we can win ten games a year, I'm fine. That's Mm -hmm. cool with me. So, would you be surprised in where they are right now? Mm Mm-mm. No, that that's a, it is a system. It is a machine over there now, and I like it. Like playing for him and the way he had stuff regimented, and I'm sure you can attest to this too. Being at Notre Dame, like, he, like I worked for a company, right, a corporate company uh, a year ago, and it was cool. But even then, I was like, man, this ship is not nearly as tight as it could be, just based off of how like the football team was Mm -hmm. and looking at it those are just businesses there is no different like there's expectations um you know the player is the employee there's expectations for the coach who is the ceo Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth i would say uh yeah no the way he has things regimented like we talked about with the structure um it's one of those places where you're either going to get better and play you're either gonna you you have to get better you're not going to stay stagnant if you get worse, you're going to be gone. It's not one of those environments where you can, you know, hang around and not be successful. You have to be because everybody else around you is getting pushed to that level. So it's like, 
you know how it is. I'm not about to be the only person in the DB or the RB room who's not getting better and progressing mm -hmm. and playing and doing well. And, you know, so much competition and structure in there that, like, at this point, I'm not surprised. And I think it's like that because, like I say, it was so militant when we were there. Once he – this is his system. These are all his guys now. Now they can kind of relax and we can have fun, but we're going to play. And, you know, you look at the last two seasons where, like, they made an emphasis to do that, and, you know, they're playoff caliber teams. That's what's up because – that's why it's, it's, it's interesting because he got he got hired and I was like signing day was probably like a week after or a week after. And I was like, and my high school coach, Rick Finati, we talked yeah. about him off camera a little bit. He ended up going to, to work at Michigan. And I'm like, dang, like I was but I was I was already, I was already locked in. I, I had my hat and everything ready for Notre man, Dame. You'd have been, you would look I, good in the Mason I wasn't and our deep man, our DB our room. Did, Man, and that was and that was the thing because I was like I was hurt my freshman and yeah. sophomore year too. So I'm thinking like, in my head, I'm like, dang, if I went to Michigan, I, I would have been, I probably wouldn't be hurt. I'd be mm -hmm. playing, you know. You just start to think about all the different, and you that's know. That's why I went to SC because I knew if something happened to me, I'd be feeling that way. And I'm the type where if I'm feeling that way, I'm gonna act on it. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? But that's real. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you're good. And so, even when I like, I sit there and I think about that, and it's just like. It was because it was fun watching those games. Mm -hmm. Like you, you talk about the DB room, Jordan Lewis, Peppers. Yep. Um, I think Bino was one. Strip, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's still playing. He's in. Uh, he's doing USFL. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the the DB room was crazy. Ty Tyree Kennel was yep. in my class. He ended yep. up going there. So knowing a lot of guys there, it was just like dang. But I I, I mean I saw the talent, so I knew knew y'all was gonna be good, but. You know, talk about your uh, – you talked about Harbaugh a little bit. So, talk about your career there. You know, um, watch this – or I didn't watch the Super Bowl, but we, we looked up some stuff on, mm -hmm. on your career and everything. And, obviously, you had, like, a huge run in the Citrus Bowl. So, you know, talk about that transition to where, you know, you finally get comfortable. you at Michigan. You're a Michigan man. I, mm -hmm. I, I hear that stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it means, but – just honestly, talk about your I time there. From there, and can start saying it. I just say it all the time. You know, <laughs> I, I'm with you on that. Um, it was cool. I mean, like I said, it brings me back to that point where it's like nobody plays and not play in the NFL, right? So like I look back and it's like, yeah, I wish I ran for, you know, ten thousand yards and won the Heisman, the Doak Walker, and you know, mm -hmm. had the fairy tale. But it didn't. Uh, it didn't work like that. And I mean, I think you know how it is. You know. A 12-week season, it may not seem long when you only watch on Saturdays, mm -hmm. but there's a lot that goes on and transpires. Um, I know I had even been at one point where uh, I got in a little trouble, and Harbaugh brought me into his office. He said, uh, you know, let me know what you want to do. I can start sending your tape to other schools. You know, I can get you situated somewhere else. And um, I was just kind of like, man. If I transfer anywhere else, it's going to be a small school. Sure, I can play, but the degree is not going to be the same. Like, if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be in a bad way just because there's not as many resources. So mm -hmm. I, I sat in his office. I told him, I was like, you know, if you can't kick me off the team, I'm not going nowhere. So, you know, do what you mm -hmm. got to do. I, I'll take care of, you know, my mm -hmm. end, whatever it may be. And he was just like, uh, oh, good luck. Pretty much. He told me, he said, I don't really see no bright future or nothing like that for you here. But you're right. I can't kick you off the team. So if you want to stay, go for it. Um, went through spring ball that year. I think that was spring of 16. Probably best spring I had. Um, came out two in the depth chart. Like at the end of that, he told me, he was like, you know, all right, you got a clean slate, no issues. You're good to go. But, um, you know, sometimes there's residual effects, and I'm not saying that may have been one of them, but there was just always little things where it would be like throughout the course of a season. If I was playing, you know, 40 snaps in August, by the time it comes in November, it might be 10. You know, for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's just one of those things, right? There's a lot of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I look at a season, it's almost like a basketball game, right? It's a game of runs. You might have a run of three, four weeks where you're doing excellent, you may have a run of two or three weeks where it's like, man, I need to play better. I, I can't stand to watch myself on film. But, uh, I mean, like I said, I, I, like I said, my personal thing is I wish I balled and did all these great things, and I didn't. But I still have to be thankful for the stuff that I did do, and I got to realize 
just like you do. I'm sure there's people all the time who might chirp you or troll you, but it's like, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff that a lot of people cannot, Mm -hmm. right? It's not that you don't want to, you cannot. So, you know, I got to remind myself that, but overall, I have no complaints. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, everything isn't necessarily supposed to be fair. It'll make me better in, you know, other facets of life, but, uh, you know, it's just part of it. Because I don't think you'll ever interview anybody who ever played at that high of a level who's like, yeah, I'm happy I didn't play in the NFL, you know. But I also don't – I don't take that away from my experience at Michigan, you know. Mm-hmm. I had a great time. Fucking, You know you know how it is. If your team's good, they're going to treat you great. You mm-hmm. have accessibility to whatever you want. Um, and actually going back on what you were talking about, about the transition, <clears throat> the only thing I really miss is – when you're playing for Michigan and you're balling and doing all this, everybody and their mother, whether it's an alumni or whoever, they want to talk to you. They want to hear what you have to say. They want to help you. When that star starts, you know, fizzling out, the wanting to talk and help, and that changes. Mm-hmm. And I think that was always kind of crazy to me. Like, damn, you know, if you only valued me for football, I should have been treating you different, right? I should only value you for what you could have done for me. Mm-hmm. So that kind of opened my eyes to that, but... I would say, you know, overall as an experience, I loved it. You know, I got a passport for free. I got to go to Italy with the team and travel. Um, Probably played in front of more than a million people, lifetime, like, Mm -hmm. you know, total. So, shit, man, I would do it again. Even look, even I I think that's, you know, huge what you just said to where, because I feel like you're you're speaking from, you know, hindsight. You're Mm -hmm. speaking, you know, we're always wiser, you know, now – um, looking back on things and, you know, as you were going through that moment, you know, going through those tough times where it's like in your head, you may think it's something else. You know, you talk about the residual, you talk about the the, comfort, uh, the conversation you had with Harbaugh and, and those things to where you're still the individual person who has to go through that. Right. And, you know, you got class, you got family. You got the weather. <laughs> you got, yeah, you know up, what I mean? Man, like people don't people don't understand that weather make a difference when uh, you know when things ain't dude, going we well. Had my going into my senior year, we had forty seven or like fifty straight days, not a single ounce of sunlight. Mm-hmm. Boy, you want to talk about seasonal depression? And it was spring ball. Yeah, I didn't think I was gonna make it, Sean. But, <laughs> but, so so when you it. when you going when you going through that, you know, uh, if you can put yourself, you know, back in that in that spot. Because we talk about, you know, you talk about how the alumni, the fans want to talk to you when things yeah. are going great. That's a point of emphasis in its own because it's like, while you there, yeah. just how they going to take advantage of you, you got to kind of take advantage of them yep. in, that same, in that same moment. And so while you're going through these, you know, uh, ev- while you're going through this adversity and, you know, the season's not going the way you want it to go because a lot of people don't understand, like, when you put so much time into your craft – right. The only thing you want out of it is just to be rewarded, you know, from the work. And and that's and obviously that's playing on the field and that's, yeah. you know, putting up good stats and whatever, whatever. But when those things happen, it's just like it's, it's, it's it hurt. It hurts your heart. So kind of just, you know, if you can put yourself back in, you know, in those shoes in that moment to where it's like how you got through it, because I think your story mm-hmm. can help a lot of people yeah. coming after you for sure. And it may be kids right now yeah. who are going through that situation right now where a coach might not be, you know, messing with them, uh, you know, depressed on whatever family, any issues that, you know, that's affecting them on the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I just want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, man, I I would say my biggest thing was you got, you got to look in that mirror, right? Like I would say, I found out who I am just going through some of them tough times where it's like, I would always take it like this. Like, if I'm doing something and I'm, yeah, like, oh, you're still playing? Oh, you're still up there? When I would hear that, that would be motivation for me because hearing it that way, I would tell myself, if they say it like that, it's because they would have quit already, right? Or I would look at, man, this would be the easy way out. If I think that coach isn't messing with me because, you know, I can't play well, I can't do this, whatever they think that it is that I can't do, just the way I'm wired – like, I'm not going to fold for that. So, like, okay, cool. You think that I can't go to class and, you know, maintain this and still practice and play well? Cool. I'm going to do every single thing in my power to prove you wrong, right? Now, that's hurt me in some cases, but I know for me personally, 
that was always my motivation, right? Um, prove to myself. It was never for anybody else. It wasn't for the coach. It wasn't for, you know, my mom and dad or my girl or my homies or none of that. It was, am I who I think I am, right? Um, and you know, like I know, to have the respect of your peers, right? Mm. Like I just, my biggest thing was I never wanted to quit. I never wanted you to look at me and think I had some quit in me, right? Like as your teammate, I wanted you to be able to look at me and be, all right, he gonna, like, he'll be solid. I don't have to worry about him. Um, and it was, it was a lot of tough times where I really have to, you know, dig deep and look in that mirror and, hey, you are who you think you are. You can accomplish these things. Um, I know for a lot of kids, you're not going to hear it from a coach a lot of times, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may not hear it from your friends. You may not hear it from the people close to you because they don't know what it is you're going through. A lot of people have not been in this machine that is, you know, college football or professional football for somebody or high school football for kids that are listening, right? I just, like I said, I, I would always kind of turn to self and – you know, just, just positive self-talk, positive mental attitude, right? Like if I can wake up and, and, and be positive and attack the day, I'm going to be way better off than if I'm walking around moping, feeling sad for myself. Because at the end of the day, I could spend 24 hours feeling sad for myself and I didn't get no better and I didn't get no farther towards my goal. And uh, I know that was always my biggest thing. I know, you know, we talked about it off camera, how hard it is just just – like work out with no no set deadline or there's nothing coming up. Like I know when I hurt my knee, right when I hurt my knee, they had me between fourth and seventh round. That was my draft grade. I said, all right, cool. And it made it really easy to train, even after I had surgery, because it's like I'm going to play at the next level, mm -hmm. right? Like I still have a purpose. I'm going to do this. And when I got back 100% healthy and nobody called, Man, it was like every, my whole everything and my whole world just came crashing to the floor, right? And uh, I would say definitely for me that was the 100% darkest time ever, right? I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to do nothing. I didn't want to leave the crib. I didn't, I didn't want to go see my girl. I didn't want to talk. No, nothing. I didn't want to do nothing because I felt like everything that I was about just died. Um, and, you know, I would say six months or so went by and it's like, all right, you know, you got, you got to pick yourself up because nobody else is going to come in here and do it for you. Um, just like nobody's going to put the work and effort in for you. You know, if you're not playing well, you have to do it. Um, and it was kind of one of those things that kind of went back to those principles where it was like, I got to do something every day, accomplish something. Even if, it, if it's a 10 minute run around the neighborhood, or if I go to the gym for 30 minutes, like I just had to kind of get back into that cycle of doing things to feel like I'm accomplishing something because... I felt like I lost my purpose. So what can I accomplish if I have no purpose? That's that's uh, that's what I was going through. But like I I know for some people it might be tough, but I really would you know go in the bathroom, go in the mirror. Like you are who you think you are. Like you have to believe in you, right? Because if you came to somebody and wanted to do an interview with them and you weren't self confident and you didn't sound sure of yourself, do you think that they would want to do it with you? Hmm. No, I don't, I don't want to be a part of an experiment or nothing right. like that. I don't. And I would just always tell myself, you know, believe in you. You can accomplish these things. You can do these things. Take yourself seriously. So that way, when you're around these people who have the ability to put you in, if you will, they see, you know, you, there's devotion to it. It matters to you. And uh, that's that's the one thing I can say. There's going to be a million people who can tell you what you what you can't do, what you won't do. Um, you're not good enough, not whatever. Okay, that's fine. You can exist, but I'm here to, I can rely on me. I will always be my own biggest fan. And not out of, you know, arrogance or anything, but, man, confidence, confidence to me breeds success, right? Like, you were confident when you started doing this endeavor that you're doing now, right? Mm -hmm. And you've become successful. You're good at it. You're good at what you do. I've looked at your page. Like, I enjoy watching these interviews, these podcasts. You do a good job. But I can tell that you're confident in what you're doing. And I think that sometimes, you know, you may lose that. You're not playing. You're not balling. You're not identifying with what you normally were. So you don't have that confidence. Well, now you're not the same person, right? Mm -hmm. You're not the same. That's not what they were looking for. You always have to be you, no matter what it is. So 
I mean, that would just be my biggest thing. Don't ever lose yourself or your confidence to a situation. Just, it, it'll never, always be yourself. As long as you can be you confidently, you can't lose. Mm-hmm. That was beautiful. God, that shit was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got a couple more. I don't know. All right. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You went, let me rephrase that. In 2018, okay. you joined the AAF. I did. How was your experience in that? And specifically, I want to know, like, what the final days of that were for you. Because that league kind of started, went mm-hmm. a few weeks, and then just, like, stopped kind of seemingly instantly. Um, uh, how was your experience in the AAF? So, the AAF. I, uh, if I'm being 100% honest, I was excited that I was able to be a part of it. I was excited that I was still playing. But in the back of my head, I felt less than because I'm like, man, bro, like this ain't the NFL. Like I just it ain't even the G League. You know what I'm saying? Like man, I'm, I'm, I'm I, being real. I do, felt less than. I don't want to cut you off, but like everyone, like even my agent, mm-hmm. uh, he might see this. I don't care. But uh, <laughs> everyone is just like, oh, you playing XFL, you playing USFL. And I'm like, you know, for sure. But I'm like, bro, I played at Notre Dame straight up. I played every single game on national television. Yep. I played every single game in a sold out crowd. We we would fly somewhere. We would have a we would land. We'd have a police escort mm-hmm. to our hotel. We'd have a police escort to the game. Like f- I'm talking about, we eating steaks for dinner. Like every like the whole town is shut every- down when Notre Dame football <laughs> shows up. Your hotel is flooded. People know y'all there. Yeah, this is so, important. There's people wearing Notre yeah. Dame stuff. You know, there's a football game, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're in the AAF. We fly into Atlanta. We look like just a big ass group of adults <laughs> riding around in a bus together. You know what I'm saying? They, they don't know what's going on. It um, and, and I'm not taking nothing away from it. Right? It was good money. Um, you know, you got to play football, but it, it just it wasn't the same. It just you know, I'll never forget. I played for Birmingham. <laughs> we get there first first week we get in because everything was in San Antonio for training camp. Mm-hmm. So we fly back from San Antonio. We get to Birmingham. First day we go into practice, and it had rained and been windy the night before. We get out there, bro. It was the old school turf. It wasn't even the new shit. It's the old school turf. We get out there. There's big ass bubbles on the field because it done got like water pockets and shit up under the field. <laughs> and I remember I'm like, man, bro. Are you- 10 weeks and it's like this already you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and uh it was a humbling experience to say the least i um like i say i i I felt like i was definitely capable of playing at the highest level and then uh it was actually interesting they picked up trent richardson right Mm -hmm. and i knew i said hey this is a new league they got to put people in the seats they got to have, you know, exposure on TV. This is Trent Richardson. We was in high school when he was playing. He was a huge name. Mm-hmm. I understand. I, I'm I'm all for it. I understand the business. If I get 10, 12 carries a game, I feel like that's enough where I could do what I got to do to go to the next level. Mm-hmm. Because that's what they told us. This is all about playing at the next level, right? You're not here to hang out and make a career. Mm-hmm. Cool. No problem. Um, I guess what started bothering me is I'm like, dude, we got dudes on this team that are like 30, 31, 32 years old that played in the NFL and got bounced. Like, they're not going back. So what what are we doing? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I I think that was probably my biggest gripe because, I mean, it got to a point where, like, Trent never came out, and I'm, you know, solid dude, but he ain't going back. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, what what, what are we doing here? And uh, crazy story, crazy story. I can't remember the offensive coordinator's name. We were in, like, our version of fall camp. And I'm like, man, the way he's teaching this, I don't get it. And I've learned six different offenses, and I so I know I can pick it up. I'm The way he's teaching us, it's not hitting my head right, coach. I need some help. Oh, you'll figure out. So we go the next day of practice, and I fuck something up. And I'm like a perfectionist when it comes to this. So I trip out. I'm like, man, bro, like, I've been asking for help. The way he's coaching is not it's not working for me. I need help, right? Like, I'm coming to you. I need help. Well, he didn't like that. Not not one bit, right? I went from second right behind Trent to fourth on the depth chart. And I'm like, oh, if I get cut from this shit, I'm never going home. <laughs> I'm never going home. So, uh, 
we we go through all that. I end up making the team, but he never never rocked with me after that, right? And I was to the point. I even told I told the GM I was like, "Look, bro, this is not about the money. Like, I want to play football. Like, you can release me. Please let me play some. I just want to play. I just want to play football. That's it." Oh, you should be happy to be here, blah, blah, blah. I said, I am happy to be here, but I want to play. So that following week, running back room had a bad, bad week. And I knew. I said, man, this it. I told him, I said, just let me be here till Tuesday so I get my check. Mm-hmm. I packed my truck up. I had my truck down there. I had my whole, the bed of my truck was loaded up. I had all my totes and shit because I knew. I said, I'm going to get cut. They're going to bring in somebody new because I was the only one not playing. Mm-hmm. They cut the dude that was playing in front of me, left me on the team, and brought somebody else in and played him over me. I said, oh, man. And that's when I knew. I was like, all right, I'm checked out. Mm-hmm. And then at, by the time, because they, they still owe us two game checks, because I signed, I signed a contract for 10 games. We only played eight, so I'm going to hold on to that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, week eight came around. And, shit, I probably learned like y'all did. Fucking Twitter. Mm-hmm. Looked on Twitter. They said, this shit over with. And then they sent us a message, you know, like the team works or whatever, Teamwork, just, yeah. hey, come into the facility. Man, these dudes didn't let us keep a sock. I don't got a jersey. I don't got a nothing from the AAF. So it was cool. But like you say, I they got mad at me because I was like, you know, I love the opportunity. It's a good experience, but this is nothing like what I'm used to. And, like, after the AAF, like I said, I went down to Jacksonville for a quick second. And it, it was. You can't even compare the two. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we are talking about Strib. Strib played in the AAF with me, did the XFL, did Canada, and is in the USFL now. And it's just kind of grind, man. I, I The best, I never went to a JUCO, but I, but I got to imagine it's pretty similar. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But uh, did you do, a, you didn't do any of that. I didn't did do it, so... <clears throat> My whole thing was, and this pretty much was why I started this podcast, because I was like, that was that was the thought, that was the same thought that I had is like, with my injury history, it was like, yo, I don't know if I'm gonna is go play. It? Is it worth it? O- only really I'm putting my body on the line again is if it's for the NFL. That, hey, that focus minimum. I can that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can make a living yeah, off yeah, of that. I, can I can't that. make a living off of what they paying in the USFL, but I don't even know what it is now. Uh, USFL was like it was around like fifty k for it's like t- a- and AAF was seventy. I was shocked, and I mean we was they was breaking us. It off. was, but it's it's nice, but like what you I feel like what people don't understand what that is is like how much time goes into preparation for football. Yep. To where it's like it's not just oh I'm gonna go play this this league for X amount of time I'm gonna make fifty k and then go do what else I want to do. Mm-mm. It's like no, you got to no, expand. That's a year-round thing. You got to think how much does it cost to go to somewhere like Cary, right? Exactly. Like that ain't cheap. Mm-hmm. That at a minimum is four or five hundred dollars a month, right? Mm-hmm. So just in keeping my body right and just all the things that I need, it's not unreasonable to think you're gonna spend twenty, twenty five thousand like in preparation. Exactly. So I done spent half of what I earned to do this and I probably need to get another job, but who else is gonna let me do what I need to do to have my body right to play a, a mm-hmm. season? So it is, it's kind of tough. And you never want to sit up and complain about the money because you know, you're because you're doing I, it to I, yeah, go to the and, next and, level. And I got yeah, paid to play a game, mm-hmm. bro. I can remember third, fourth grade. Like all I want to do is whoop somebody ass in 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 lunch, or recess in football. And now you paying me to do it. Mm-hmm. Like all I got to do is get up and go to a facility, and I get paid. So it was kind of hard for me to complain, and I, and I wouldn't. But it was like man, like because I do, bro. I got a bad memory now, like terrible. I forget shit all the time, and I start thinking. I'm like man. Is forty eight hundred bucks a month worth that, or not a month? A week is forty eight hundred bucks a week worth that. It might have been when I was twenty three. Is it now? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, like I'd be thinking about that. I'm like, man, dude, if I forget stuff now, how's it gonna be in 15, 20 years? It could be. It could be from whatever. Right. But shit, you gotta start putting two and two together. Whereas, man, I was in the trenches. I did a lot of banging. Like I, like we talked about sciatica. I got mm-hmm. a bad back. I, I was squatting a month ago. I tweaked my back. I couldn't stand up straight for two weeks. And somebody asked me, do I want to play a season? It ain't that I want to. Can I? You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I refuse to say I'm getting old. Hell no, I can't yeah. do that. No, definitely. And so that's and that kind of just brings me to my point, you know, before we close, 
is a big reason, you know, why I started this podcast is because I wanted to use it as another, um, another like outlet mm -hmm. in, a, in a way to where I feel like athletes feel like, and we, we could use, we don't have to use strip, but we could use anyone to where an athlete is like so, so driven and so focused on that goal of, you know, being an NFL player or being a professional player that I'm 25 right now. So it's like, if I had played, if I felt, if I had played just two years trying to get back into the league, that's wear and tear on my body, you know, um, time, like not in the, in the corporate field or, mm -hmm. And yeah, that's huge that you said that before we close, there's one thing I want to touch mm -hmm. on with that time in the corporate field. And then also like I plan on starting a family one day. And like right. in order, I feel like in order for me to start a family, like I want to be like good myself. Straight up. And so I was like, I just started looking at it to where we got to like February. I didn't get a call or anything like that. So I'm like, I'm like, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm young. Mm -hmm. um, I could, I could travel and do all those things, but I got a great network. Still within the space. Everybody watching, just knowing, like, I could do that. And it's not uh, like an unrealistic, like, you some dude sitting in the bar with me telling me you were, you know, you could do it because you were good in high school, you know, 20 years yeah. ago. Like, you know you can do it. It, it only, it only bother, it only bother me sometimes when, like. You would see a dude you played over. I see, not even that, though, because, <laughs> because I understand, like, my, my path. Right. And what I've had to go yep. through to, 100%. because there, like, there's players that I, I believe that I'm better than who yep. are probably like pro bowlers, yep. and we played against in high school, college, or whatever the case may be. But like I, I've come to like understand that just like our paths are two yep. are completely different. Um, I tell you like, oh, it's like I get urged in my first two years and like, oh, I'm going to the league. Mm -hmm. It was someone that's from my home area, Marshawn Lattimore. Yep. Who got injured his first two years? Played his third year. Went straight to went top five or top ten, maybe yeah, nah, top five. Crazy, yo. So to me, it wasn't like okay, I'm gonna get hurt two years. I'm gonna go ball out and play. So it was like those were just things that I was thinking. But just like as my career went on, yep. like reality started to hit into where it's like, yo, I got these three injuries. I'm 24 coming out as a rookie. Like it may like it may not be it. Isn't that crazy? Because I remember thinking too. I'm like, damn, dude, I'm 23 as a like. Rookie age twenty three, like I was twenty three. Yeah, I'm like, there's dudes who've been in the league like since they were nineteen, since they, twenty. Exactly. They were young, you so, know so I look at it at that point. It's like reality sets in. It's like I got a taste of it. Mm -hmm. So I think like since I was like able to go through camp and, and do those things, I like my goal was always to just like because it, it changed. You know, obviously you got to be real with yourself, and it was like, yo, if I could just get the opportunity, like then you can't take that from me. No, that's real. And so now that I look at it, it's just like. I just I I'm I'm real with myself to yeah. where it's like I could I know I could be out there playing but now it's just not my calling right. like it's 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 not it wasn't meant for me to be out there playing because if I was I feel like a number of things you know wouldn't happen I probably wouldn't be you know sitting here right now doing right, this definitely yeah. uh, some of the relationships that I have now I wouldn't have so yeah. like a lot of things that I'm grateful for now yeah. probably wouldn't happen if I was you know on the team right now so. But I, I say all that to say because it's like, you know, athletes, you know, train and, and do all these things to and spend two, three years, four years maybe trying to just get to that NFL to where it's like I look at classmates at Notre Dame or you you talk about your friend and it's like I'm competing for this $50,000 job playing this game to hopefully get to the NFL and they could go start a normal corporate job getting like 60, 70 and then in that year and a half, they get promoted. Then another year and a half, they get promoted. And it's like, I'm still chasing this fit. I'm still in this this bracket, this range over here. And it's like, they still, and they growing. And I think that, especially for the black community, I feel like that could be a reason, you know, why we're behind. Mm -hmm. And it's not that like, we, we talked about earlier, it's like athletics, entertainment, things like that. But it's like- You feel like some of it's ego? I know for oh, me, a one, lot of one, it was. 1,000 yeah. percent. Because it's yeah. like for me, it was. I I hate right even to this day. I hate posting like IG reels of just like podcasts because it's like my followers probably don't care about this. Like this isn't what I, like I want to post football pictures. They probably want to see something cool, glamorous, whatever. So it's like it's like 
I low key gotta like fight myself sometimes just to like post oh, bro, a I picture. Got, I got catalogs that I just won't post because I almost feel like it's that shit's over. I can't like I don't do that no more. Mm -hmm. Like I just gotta let it go. Mm -hmm. And 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 I know we shouldn't be like that. It's I mean, but it's tough because it's like and I and I mean as I'm going on, it's 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 starting to get easier and whatever. But my whole thing is it's like I want to provide us. Uh, I want I want to be someone that someone like a an athlete coming out can look to and be like. Okay, if the NFL or if you know NBA or professional sports don't work out, you still got your entire network that you've trained, like people that you've trained with your entire life. You still know the game. Right. You still have a passion for the game, and it's like now, especially with social media and the way content is, this is my way of saying like this is another option. This is another way to be connected, to make money, to 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 be entertaining, to do all those things that you want to do, to be around the same people to where it's like, so that's like my mission. That's like my mission with this podcast. Is so like, I got, I got a question for you then. And I don't mean to cut you off. I know when I came out, the whole defense, so it would have been my school senior year, not, you know, football timeline. That whole defense got drafted into the league and then probably like five or six dudes offensively got drafted. Bunch of guys made rosters, right? Man, and I know in talking to them, I know I was wrong to feel this way, but I felt like when all my homies made it to the league, like both my roommates went and played. Uh, Taco Charlton just got picked up by the Bears. That was one of my roommates. Um, Delano Hill, one of my best mm -hmm. friends, he was in Seattle. Man, I, I felt like I, I felt like my place, like the friendship. And this isn't anything they did to me, but personally, I was like, man, like I don't even. I feel like a regular. You know, like a regular motherfucker that I'm not. I don't feel like I'm in the group. Like, they're still playing. They're, they're everything that we had, they mm -hmm. still have, and I don't, right? Like, I, I took a step back. Like, I don't know. How, like, like, I felt less than. Almost like with the AAF shit. Like, I wouldn't even talk about that mm -hmm. with them. And, uh, like I said, it just, when, the way you were saying stuff, it just made me think of that. Where it was like, man, I, I did. I alienated myself from, like, people I was cool with because I was like, I'm not as good as them. They're, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm lesser than what they are. And for anybody who's going through that or thinks that, you're 100% wrong. Whether it be, your, you know, you going NAIA and your friends are going D1 or whatever it may be, that's not going to determine how people around you really treat you. But mm -hmm. you, I couldn't see that, right? Because I would go somewhere and it's like, well, why aren't you playing? Why isn't this? Why isn't that? And it's like, damn, dude, that's for the amount of time and effort I got put into it, it's a simple question, but to me, that's intimate, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm, there's a lot to unpack when you ask me that, and you ask me this question, like, it's, you know, why'd you miss the bus? Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And I circle back to the start of the interview, that kind of goes with that identity question I was asking yeah. you guys about, because, like, you guys obviously did it on a super massive scale, but even high schoolers, like, when they're playing sports and then 18 and they got to enter, like, the real world or whatever, like, that's a valid point. Um, which, which, before we finish, what do you want to uh, touch on? It is crazy how you said you lost out in the corporate world, right? Because I am I just turned 28. Well, I don't feel like I lost out. No, no I, I'm saying like the time. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Where I think left, people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. You, if, if you're a regular student, you leave school at 21, 22, you're in the corporate world, right? So the last time I played, I was in Dallas when COVID started and they shut the XFL down and sent us back, right? Mm -hmm. So... So we'll say 2020. I waited around, wanted to see what happened, kind of like everybody else did, didn't work, didn't do anything. So then I got a job last year, 2021. But, like, now I'm trying to get in the medical sales field. It's like I'm 28 with a relatively small resume, and I'm competing against, you know, kids that are fresh out of school or, you know, there's 24, 25, 26-year-olds mm -hmm. who have already done this for three or four years. And I'm like, man, dude, I'm way behind the eight ball, like, Everything, it, it, it's like everything that I knew in football, that's how little I know about the other side. And, like, that is one thing, too, that kind of pushed me away from chasing and chasing and chasing because I'm like, okay, if I play three or four years in the AFL, XFL, USFL, what have you, how much of that money is going to be saved, right? If we being real, like mm -hmm. I go, what, I go get a different crib or something and not even like I'm buying a crib. Like yeah, I just no. got down payment money to start making payments on a crib or a car or whatever. How much is going to be left? And then I'm going to be that much farther behind these kids who know what they're doing. They studied to be in this field. They're as good at this as I was at something else. That was another push for me, too, where it was like, man, I, I, 
I don't want to be any farther behind. There's stuff in real life that you've done that I haven't experienced because we have different paths. But at this point, I feel like I'm losing, Mm -hmm. which may not be the case. And a lot of people will tell me, oh, man, it's not like that. Your path was different. Enjoy it, blah, blah, blah. Which, And I can understand that. But you're not in my shoes where I feel like I'm losing the race. And time. I got got a long ways to catch up. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, Because that was a big thing for me. It was like. I feel like a lot of uh, in football, you don't control a lot mm-hmm. of things that happen. And oh. so you don't control if a team calls you. And mm-hmm. so my thing, my whole thing was like, let me stop, you know, putting so much effort and focus and en- energy into something that I can control and let me go into a field that I can control. Well. And so that's, you know, how I started this podcast and, you know, hopefully continue to, you know, elevate it and, and keep going forward with it. But that's the, the, the purpose of this is just to inspire uh, student athletes, just individuals in general, to um, get involved in something else that that allows you to still, you know, be involved with your passion mm-hmm. um, and around your passion. To where it's like, obviously, I hated speak, I hated interviews, I hated talking, I hated doing podcasts. I did one podcast, I think, before uh, or I did like three podcasts total mm-hmm. before I started my own. Right, and I was just like, but if I want to just continue to just be around sports and continue to have a reason just to 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 hang out with my like homies and talk and, right. and BS and whatever, whatever. It was like, shoot, let me just start a podcast. Let me let me, uh, you know, explore the different route. And so now I use it as like if I want to go, I'll go train, like, for example, with Carrie or mm-hmm. something in Chicago. It's like I kind of got a purpose to go train. Now. I was like, when I go train, I'm going to go meet some new athletes while I'm training. Right. I'm young. I can still, you know, get run with them, do everything I could, you know, do that they can do. And that gives it's you like credibility. In that moment, it's like, all right, bet. Now I'm training with you. Let me get right. to know you. And it's like, okay, now nah, I, I didn't met like three, four new guests, yep. potential guests for the podcast. And so that's kind of how I look at it now. And um, I know we 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 probably went over time, but uh, I appreciate you, you know, coming in and, and yep. stopping in. Definitely uh, go link up, but. Appreciate Elliot for introducing us and then, you know, you just, you know, being real, honestly, being authentic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Varsity House Podcast. Uh, follow all of our social media accounts, Varsity House Podcast. And what um, you saying? Like, comment, subscribe. Yeah, the, like the link right here. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. I don't do the editing, but the link going to be somewhere. So somewhere. make sure you uh, you check that out. Um, this obviously this is a special episode, but. Um, you know, be sure to to tune in for more uh, videos like this. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. Perfect.